On today's show, we've got something really special for you, a charity project for woodworkers fighting cancer. We're gonna make this easy to build toy chest. Now, as you can see, this is not your average toy chest. We've got quite a bit going on here, and this is clearly made for a kid, but it does have finger-saving technology. I think that might be trademarked, and we might now owe somebody money. But let me show you some of the other features. When the lid comes down, the decorative curves help prevent little pinched fingers. Hinge supports keep the lid open and slow its descent. A whiteboard surface serves as the front and back panels. The sides feature book storage, and the lid doubles as a play surface for Legos, trains, or whatever. The whole thing is made from pre-milled poplar and birch plywood, and I gave mine a nice milk paint finish. So that's the project. Here's more about the charity. Woodworkers Fighting Cancer is a charity event that Nicole and I started back in 2010. And since then, we've raised nearly $40,000 for various cancer charities. This year, the money goes to the Cancer Research Institute. So how does it work? You download the plan for this project, you build it, and you send me a picture of the finished piece by the end of November, and I'm gonna donate $5 per finished piece that I receive. Now that's one per person. Now again this year, we're gonna partner with Steve over at Mere Mortals, and he's gonna make a version that might be slightly different, but in the same vein. Bottom line is you need to build either his version or my version to qualify for this, but make sure you send the pictures to me so I can tally everything up because we have corporate sponsors, and this is the coolest part. I'm donating five bucks, and there's a bunch of companies who are matching my donation, and they are really going above and beyond this year. We even have some charity auctions sponsored by Powermatic. All right, so here's some of those great companies who are helping us out with the fight against cancer. Festool, making woodworking faster, easier, and smarter. Bell Forest Products, my personal favorite lumber source. Brusso, American-made precision hardware. Eagle America, the world's router bit source, and Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. I'm gonna start by breaking down the plywood. I find the most back-friendly way to do this is on the floor. A few foam insulation boards keep the plywood a safe distance from the concrete. I'll do the cutting with a shop-made track and a circular saw. The track is made from particle board shelf stock and a thin strip of MDF. The saw blade just kisses the edge of the guide, making it super easy to line up with my marks. So I measure for the first cut and extend the line with a large framing square. The guide simply goes right up to the line and the cut is made. At this point, it's a good idea to cut these parts oversized since we'll eventually want to cut off all of those factory edges. The real key to cutting down plywood accurately is to remember which edges are freshly cut and then use those edges as reference for subsequent cuts. Obviously, the large framing square helps a lot. Now there's our top and bottom pieces. The remaining piece gets its factory edge trimmed off, and then we can cross cut the two side pieces to length. The sides can be cut to final dimension, but the top and bottom are only cut to width. The length is kept rough for now. For the box frame, I'm using pre-milled 3 quarter inch thick poplar. Since the stock is already cut to width, all I need to do is square up the ends and cut the pieces to the lengths listed in the cut list. I like to use my chop saw for the cross cuts and a stop block helps ensure accuracy when cutting similar length parts. All of the rails and styles are cut to final length at this point. By the way, your short rails should match up perfectly with the width of your plywood sides. The actual number isn't as important as the fact that they're exactly the same. If you want some curves like the ones featured in our design, here's how you make them. Find the center line of a short rail and then measure in 3 quarters of an inch. Now use a thin strip of scrap to bend a curve shape from the outside corners to the 3 quarter inch line. A second set of hands can really help here. I usually work alone, so I like to use one of those nifty Lee Valley drawing bows. Now cut the curve using the jigsaw with a high tooth count blade. The cutting will be slower, but it'll also be cleaner. Of course, even the best jigsaw blade will leave a surface that still needs work, so I use my spoke shave to finalize the shape of the curve and further smooth the surface. You can also use a simple shop-made flexible sanding strip. Now use the first piece as a template for the rest. If you have a router and a flush trim bit, that would be a great way to go. Otherwise, just mark the remaining short rails and repeat the curve cutting process. We'll do the same thing for three of our four long rails, starting with one rail as a template, and then using that to cut the remaining rails. 
Remember, the back top rail doesn't receive a curve. Well, now we can start our side sub-assemblies. And if you're gonna assemble with screws, you wanna get to know this little guy here. It's a countersink bit. There are a lot of different countersink bits on the market, but this one I happen to like a lot. It's got an adjustable bit, so you can control the depth there. You've also got, of course, the countersink section here and a stop collar that controls the depth of the countersink. So in this case, we're gonna drive our screws nice and deep, and then we'll be able to come back with some dowel rod and cut it to cap them off so that you don't see the screw head. All right, so let's do some assembly. Let's start by attaching the side styles to the rails. Two screws each should do the trick. I'll drive the screws at about one inch and then two and a half inches in from the end. These holes will go at the top and the bottom of each vertical style. Now it's time to pre-drill for the plywood side panel. Strike a line about seven eighths of an inch in from the inside edge. Drill four to five holes down the length. To assemble our sides, I drop in two inch and a half spacers to help position the plywood panel, which should also be flush with the top of the styles. A clamp snugs things up, and a dead blow hammer allows me to make fine adjustments. It's a good idea to pre-drill the panel so that the screws don't cause the plywood to split. Now drive in some inch and a quarter screws. With the piece flipped over, reapply clamping pressure once the rails are in perfect position. Pre-drill and drive the screws home. And just like that, we have one of our side sub-assemblies. Repeat the process for the other side. Now our side sub-assemblies are going to be held together with these four long rails that we've already cut. And in the name of simplicity, we're going to attach them with pocket screws. So grab your favorite jig and start drilling. I center my boards on the jig and clamp it in place. The two outer holes should do the trick. Now for the other side. I don't know how much it helps, but I like to add glue to my pocket screw joints whenever possible. With a clamp in place, I drive the screws. Work your way around and attach all four rails to one of the side sub-assemblies. Now we can flip the assembly over and attach it to the other side. With the case upside down, we can install the bottom panel. The panel should already be cut to width, so we just need to mark the length. Cutting is easy enough as I extend the line with my square, clamp the guide in place, and cut. The bottom panel would be screwed up into the side panels, so we need to know where to pre-drill. The center of the side panel should be around an inch and three quarters to an inch and seven eighths in. Strike a line on both ends of the bottom panel and then pre-drill for three to four screws. Now drop in the bottom panel. If it's a snug fit, don't be afraid to give it a couple of taps with a hammer or a dead blow. For additional support, I'm going to drive screws in through the front and back rails too. I mark a guideline representing the center of the bottom panel, pre-drill and drive four screws per side. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit overkill, but that's how I do things. Flip the piece over and get ready to cut the lid. The lid panel should be cut to fit within the inside perimeter of the box. The trim will be cut from inch and a half poplar stock. I'll cut and attach the sides first. A clamp helps hold the piece in place securely while the screws are driven. The front and back are then cut to size and attached as well. Don't worry if the trim sits proud, we'll sand it nice and flush once the glue dries. Here's a quick tip for you. When you're sanding edge trim flush, be sure to keep at least 50% of the sander on the panel. If you have too much hanging off the edge, you'll create dips and valleys, and you might even round over the edge or burn through the veneer. 
Now there are a lot of hinges on the market that you could potentially use for this toy box, including regular old butt hinges, no mortise hinges, and what I've got here, a piano hinge. Now there is a special hinge out there that I highly recommend for something like a toy box, and Rockler sells them. They're called torsion hinges. The cool thing is these hinges have the built-in ability to resist the falling of the lid, so you don't have to add any supplemental safety items to it. Problem is they're very, very expensive. So we're going for simple, inexpensive here, and that's why I've got a piano hinge. Now, piano hinges are great because they cover a long length like this, which even if it's somewhat flimsy material, I mean, this is definitely not the best hinge material I've ever worked with, the fact that it goes all the way across and has as many screws as it has means it's going to be very strong, right? And it's easy to install. Let me show you how to do it. Find the center of the lid and the box on the back side. Extend that line to the edge on the case as well as to the underside of the lid. We'll use a self-centering bit or VIX bit to pre-drill for our hinge screws. Simply drop the hinge in place with the top leaf folded down. Line up the center hole with the center line and pre-drill the first hole. Drive a single screw to hold the hinge in position and pre-drill the remaining holes. Now remove the hinge and do the same operation on the underside of the lid. If you fold the hinge leaf down and line the hinge up with the center lines, the hinge should work perfectly once we do the final installation. To plug up all of those screw heads, trim a bunch of plugs from a 3 8 of an inch dowel. Notice how the tape creates a zero clearance area and prevents the plugs from falling through the base plate. Also notice that I've got a pencil mark in the tape and that helps me line up each cut. Installing the plugs is a piece of cake. A little glue in the hole, a little glue on the plug, and a few taps with a hammer. Now we've got quite a few holes to plug, so enjoy the process. While the glue on the plugs dries, I measure for my front and back panels. I'm going with some quarter inch whiteboard stock since my son loves to draw. The panels will be held in with cleats, which I'll cut from some scrap stock. One on the bottom and one on each side should do the trick. Because the strips are so close to the panel, I pre-drill the screw holes at a slight angle. Inch and an eighth screws attach the cleats securely. To further secure the panel, you might consider driving a short screw through the panel and into the top rail as well. When the plugs are dry, you can use a flush trim saw to remove the excess or go gangster style and hit it with a sander. Now remove the cleats and panels and get ready for the finishing touches. I like to hit all the sharp edges with a block plane and then follow up with the light sanding. And with that, we're done with the construction. On to the finish. Well, now we're gonna apply the finish to the toy chest and I've got my lovely wife, Nicole, here with me. Hello. She's actually gonna do the painting. Thing is, she wants it painted. I tend to not like painted pieces. So I said, look, you want it painted, lady. You're doing it yourself. I will do it myself. And that's why she's here. Mm -hmm. All right, and what we're gonna use is a product called milk paint. Now, true milk paint is really interesting. It actually predates history, recorded history. This is stuff that was used back in ancient times because it's a very basic formulation made with milk protein, uh, lime, and then pigments added for color. All right, so it's actually a pretty durable finish, but we will be adding an additional uh, water-based acrylic on top of it for extra protection because it's going to be around a toddler. Yes. So just in case. All he right. He does like milk. He does enjoy milk. He might start <laughs> trying to liquefy this stuff and, and drink it. We'll catch him over there just going, bleh, 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 licking it. So yeah, protect it. Uh, it's usually not very water resistant. So some of uh, uh, polyurethane, water-based polyurethane is a good choice. All right, so we're going to mix it up. I'm actually getting the heck out of here. This is all you now. So It's me. Let's go. Have a good time. Milk paint comes in all kinds of colors, and you can mix them to your liking. We're using one scoop of white with one scoop of pumpkin, the color my son picked out. Mix the colors thoroughly, and then add an equal amount of water. And warm water seems to work best. Add about three quarters of the water and mix to a consistent paste. Then add the remaining water to get a nice paintable consistency. And yes, a round bowl would have been much easier to work with. The great thing about milk paint is that you can dilute it as far as you want, anywhere from a light stain effect to a heavy, thick coat of paint. 
we decide to add in a product called Extra Bond, which should help the first coat bind better to the birch plywood in our toy chest. One scoop will do. Now mix for a few minutes, and be patient. Once mixed thoroughly, let the paint sit for about 10 minutes. We're going for a bit of a rustic look, so inexpensive chip brushes do the trick, and we don't feel the need to be too careful about hiding brush marks. If you're new to milk paint, start on the bottom of the case so that you can get to know the product. As the paint dries, it should take on a dull, chalky appearance. We're painting the entire case inside and out. After a few hours, the first coat can be sanded. Now, no one likes sanding, but Nicole's a champ, and she doesn't mind getting her hands dirty. Vacuum the dust with a soft brush attachment, and then mix up another batch of paint. Two things are different this time. We no longer need the Extra Bond product, and we're leaving out the white color. We didn't really like the color as much as we thought we would, which is something that can definitely happen with milk paint. You'll find the second coat goes on much easier than the first. After an overnight dry time, we get some acrylic water-based poly ready. We don't want much of a shine, so satin will do nicely. Coat the entire project thoroughly with a decent synthetic bristle brush. Keep in mind the first coat will look like crap. Don't fret, once the first coat dries, give it a light sanding with 320 grit and then proceed with the second and final coat. The second coat looks much more even and consistent, but since we're dealing with milk paint, don't expect perfection. This is a much more earthy product than most are used to. Once the finish is dry, we can install the panels and secure them with cleats. The easiest way I find to install the hinge is to lay the case down on its back. Attach the hinge to the lid first using the supplied screws. Now prop up the case with a block of wood so that the hinge lines up with the holes. Simply drive the screws, one at a time, all the way across the hinge. And for some extra added safety, I installed two lid supports on the inside of the case. Alright, so the finish is dry. I attach my Lego plates. The only thing left to do is unleash the kid. Now, if you can't build one of these toy chests, we actually have shirts and mugs where the proceeds also go to the charity. Go to TWWstore.com to find that. And I think it's time we let this kid have his toy chest. I've kept it from him long enough. You ready, Wanna buddy? Lego? Wanna play? Wanna go Lego? Say bye-bye. Bye. 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 Table saw, planer, bandsaw, shaper, and Powermatic Yellow.